Historically, they are called identity types. Um, but I'm going to call them path types interchangeably with identity types because I want to emphasize the geometric understanding of what the identity types are about. But I should, but I would like to also say that at the same time, they really have a dual role. The thing that you know from mathematics as equality is really you can understand that notion of equality, which we know from ordinary mathematics as the identity type. And that's one of the reasons why it's called the identity types. Nevertheless, there is this other way of understanding, which is that these are paths between points. So let's have a look. So first we have a formation rule. That is to say, given any type A and points S and T, we can form a type, which, will, which would be, might, might be written out like this, id S A T. Um, what am I doing here? Okay, click here. Here it is. But I'm not going to write it like that because it gets cumbersome. I'm going to think of, I'm going to write it like this. Or sometimes if it gets nasty, I will just drop the A. So because if you already know the types of S and T, there is no point in um, writing A and there's so, so I, I might just drop that, okay? Um, so think of this as paths from S to T in a space. So S and T are two points in a space A, and then we consider the space of all paths from A to, from S to T. So what are some trivial things we can say about it? So here's some. We can always have a path from T to T, which we call the identity path, and I write it like this as id path. So this is a just, you know, I have a space A, have a point T. I can have a path which doesn't go anywhere, which is constantly just always at T. These paths, you have to think of them as a, some sort of a mix between what you would think of in topology, like a continuous map from S to T. That's one way to think about them. But another one would be to think, in the, sometimes even better, is to think of these paths either as uh, edges of a graph, or maybe morphisms in a category between, so morphisms in a category is maybe not such a bad initial picture to have in mind that there are these connections from S to T, from S to T, but they don't necessarily are actual traversals through other points. They might be more abstract than that. <clears throat> um, sometimes this it path is also uh, written as raffle because obviously, um, it, it witnesses the fact that equality is reflexive. So but I will write it path. And I think maybe I was got inconsistent with notation later on, and I probably will be writing it just like this. It path, and I actually put the T here. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so, um, but that's not all, right? If you just say, well, there is a, there, you know, if you just say there is a type, and whenever you have a point from T to T, you get an element called it path. That, that's, not, that's, that's not really explaining paths. So we want to have a good punch here. And the good punch that we want to do is this. We want the paths to have a sort of a fundamental influence on everything that's going on. And here is such fundamental in influence, which I called homotopy invariance. I'm sure you could call other things which are related homotopy invariance, but bear with me here. So sometimes it's called also what, uh, uh, well, just call it, let's just call it homotopy invariance. Okay, so the idea is the following. Suppose you have a path P from S to T and you do something using S, whatever, some construction. So there's, you just construct something using S. Well, then there should be a way to take my construction and transport it along this path P so that it uses T instead of S. So that whatever depended on S, it will now depend on T. That's called homotopy invariance because if you think about it, it's sort of, you know, it's performing a kind of homotopy along P. It's moving things along P. It turns out that this is a super powerful principle. Once you have it, you can do lots of things with it. So let's try to let's try to uh, phrase it. Okay, so here's the first attempt, which I think is a completely reasonable attempt that you would try it first. So you would say, okay, so suppose I have a type over A, let B be a type over A, and then I have, a, I have somehow constructed a U in B of S. So now this U is using S, 
because it's in BIOS of S, it depends, you know, it's in this fiber. So this is what I mean by, I did something using S. Well, I constructed a point U in the type B of S, but now I want to take this and trans, trans, transport it, right? Along the path here from S to T so that it lands in B of T. So I could try to postulate such a, I, I could try to write down axioms and I would succeed in writing down axioms for such an operation. And you might write this transport maybe just as a dot or a star, or you would invent some notation. And the way you would think of this is we are transporting you along P and we will land in B of T. This is a very mathematical notation in a proof assistant, we need to be more precise and so on. But the idea is here that you can do this. Well, that would work, but it's insufficient. And the reason that it's insufficient is that in fact, the way this is written, um, we're saying, okay, we have something uh, and we, we do something at the initial point. So S is the source of my path and T is the target. And we do something at the source and whatever we do in the source, it just depends on the source. And then we end up someplace where it just depends on the target. But as it turns out in real applications, you need, you want to use Bs. So these, these constructions that you do will sometimes depend on the path itself. So you want to depend on the, both the endpoint and the path. So we need to have a more complicated uh, principle. And this principle is called path induction. So let's have a look at it. So, so now the way I'm going to phrase it is the way that you always, always use it. There are different ways of phrasing it. This is how you will end, we will end up using it in practice. In practice, what happens is this. As we said, we have a point, we have a type B and this B depends on, this B depends on both endpoints of a path. You see, here I have both endpoints. X is an endpoint, Y is an endpoint. And then P is a path from X to Y. So I have a B which may depend on all three components. And then I want to construct a section of B. So um, how do I do it? Here is the principle of path induction. It's magic, mind you, this is magic, okay? So what it says is you don't have to worry in order to get a section. So in order to do something in every fiber over B, you only have to do it in the fibers of the form Z, Z, it path Z. That is to say, if you have, so let me, let me say this in another way. If I want to make a construction which depends on a general path P in a space, P is general. P is general in the sense that both, it, both of its endpoints are arbitrary and P is arbitrary. I'm doing some, I wanna do something for all endpoints and all paths. When I am in this general situation, all I need to consider are the identity paths. That is to say, for arbitrary, I need to explain how for an arbitrary point Z, I intend to perform my, perform my construction using just Z, Z and the identity path. So it's, it's like there is a base case, right? So this is saying in order to do it for a general path, just do it for the base case, which is the identity path. It's weird, it's unusual, it's magic. So, and then once we have this D, we can then construct an element here, which I'm going to write as J. When, well, well, I will also then apply to X and Y and P. So I will write it like this, J applied to D, X, Y, P will then give me an element of B, X, Y, P like that. So I explain how to do the base case. D is the base case is the reflexivity path. And then I say, and then I can take it to any path P with endpoints X and Y, and I will get something that depends on the general path. This is still MLTT. I will, I will tell you when we switch to something that's not MLTT. Okay. And always when you introduce a concept, you should ask what equations does it satisfy? When we make pairs, when we, when we say there are pairs and projections, we need to worry what are the equations. When we make lambda abstraction and application, we need to worry how they relate by equations. Here too, we need to worry how these things relate. And so the thing that we wanna say is, well, if I plug in a reflexivity path here for X, Y, P, then I should get back the original D. Just like earlier we said, well, at zero, I get the best case. So if I stick in S, S and the identity path at S, then I will just get whatever the base case was doing for S. It's best to see this 
through examples. So let's do some examples. Okay. Um, path concatenation. Let's do path concatenation. Suppose now we want to concatenate paths. That is to say, if I have a path P from X to Y, and I have a path Q from Y to Z, X, Y, Z, paths P and Q. And now I'd like to put them together so that I get a path from X to Z, which by the way, logically speaking, is just transitivity of equality. How do I do that? Well, I ask, what am I asking for here? Well, I'm trying to construct an operation called dot for concatenation. So that's an operation and the Agda users are happy at this moment when I wrote this. So I want, the, uh, I want my operation dot. What's the type of dot? Well, the type of dot is for any X in A, okay, I'm now gonna turn it around a little bit so that I get it in the form that's suitable for path induction. For any point X in A, for any Y in A and a path P from X to Y. If I further have a third point Z and a map Q and a path Q from Y to Z, then I want to show that there is a path from X to Z. You see down here, this is my B. This is now taken the shape suitable for path induction. So if you want to be sure that you're applying path induction correctly, what you do is you write it out, whatever you're doing, you write it out in a form that says for all endpoints and the path, for any, for arbitrary endpoint X, arbitrary endpoint Y, arbitrary point path P from X to Y, I want to construct something. Then that's ripe for path induction. Okay, well, now it's a, now, but now all we need to do is we need to check the case when we plug in um, path induction. That is to say, we, oh, well, maybe it would have been better, it is more pedagogical here to write this with Z. So Z, 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 let's do it just for Z. And, but then the picture gets screwed up because I already have a Z. Now I understand why I had an X. So let's keep it at X. So we only have to do it when you have just one point and the identity path on it. So what happens if I have X only and then Y is actually, actually literally X, right? So now I plug in X, X, it path. Well, let's do it. You get pi X, A, pi Z, A, and then this Y becomes X. So this, this one is X and this is the same. Okay, do we know how to inhabit this? Well, yes, we do. How do we inhabit a type like this? This is a product type, therefore its element is going to be a function. So it's a function taking an X. So you take an X as an argument, you take a Z as an argument, you take a Q as an argument. These are the things you have. You're supposed to produce a path from X to Z. That's super easy, it's just Q. So that's my D. So that means that path concatenation can be written like this. To compose P and Q, you do the J, you explain how you did the, reflect, the identity path case, which is here. And then you say, well, apply that uh, at what? Let's be careful, at P, right? Because here we had P. Okay. So apply that at the endpoints of so X, Y, and P. And that's path concatenation. And the equation for J gives me an equation for it. It gives me an equation which states that if I compose with the identity path on the left, then I will get Q. And one of the exercises will be to prove the other one that if you have P composed with the identity path, then you get a P. Notice that here I have triple equations. So these are judgmental. And the other one will be just with a path. So you will be, you should, you will be asked to find a path. I should apply to Q, somebody says. I disagree. I think I should apply to P here. You mean here? Felix, do you mean here? That this should be Q? Is that what you're asking? Hi, at the right of the J, yeah. At the right, no, the P is correct, but at the right, because G of all of that is a function. Can I see the type of your Ah, bill? the J of that, yes, okay. Yeah, it's so a, let's be careful. Uh, not only to Q, yeah, to Z and to Q. What do you want to? Well, I, I don't know. You have to tell me what you want to. So J, uh, what? Yeah. J is already applied. J is, I already, we already apply J to all these three arguments so that okay. we, when we fully apply J, we already land in B. So I don't think mm -hmm. you need to apply Can, can I see your B please? The, which one? The B. Yeah. 
Yeah, B is a function where Q is bounded, but at the left of, of your equality on the bottom, you have, it's not bounded Q. You, it's a pass, like at the left of your equal, uh, at the bottom of answer, at the left you have a pass, and at the right you have a function type. So I don't know what. Uh, sorry, let's see if I understand you. Um, what I want? Pattern matching. This is my B. Yes. Okay. So. <laughs> uh, Q was a free variable in the left and right expressions, but it appeared only bound in the middle expression. Uh, wait, what? P is a free variable, P, X, Y. Oh, okay. So Q was here, here. Yes, here it's bound. Yes. You don't have yes, I understand time. what you're saying. Okay. So then we need here. Yes, something is messed up. Yeah, you need to apply it to Z and to Q. I'm sorry for my yes, addition, yes. my confusing so, question. So the point, the point that Felix is make, making is that we still need the Z and the Q because here, here before we actually get a path, you see, we are trying to get a path at the end. So if I just apply J, I will land in here. So when I apply J, I get this much, right? And so what I should be doing, what tricked me were the bound variables, of course, I should be writing this as a Q prime so that I don't think that that's the real Q because it's a bound one. So now this J has landed what, what it was Felix, right, Felix? Yes. 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 So what Felix was pointing out is that once you apply the J, you will land in this B, but this B is a pi type, right? So it still wants two more arguments before you get to the path. Well, what are the two more arguments? The two more arguments are the end point of Q, which is Z, and the end point and, and, and the Q itself. Is this better now? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, no, thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, okay. So then we get an equation and then here is a similar problem. This should be a Q prime, this should be Q prime. And then here we need to apply to Z and Q. Okay. I could have used a similar definition. So uh, the chat says you could use a similar definition swapping the role of P and Q. Would you get a judgmentally equal operation? A very good question. Well, the other one would have the other identity. The other one would give you the judgmentally equal, uh, judgmental neutrality of its path on the other side if you swapped P and Q. So I don't think you get the mentally judgmentally equal one, but you can show that you get a path. Get what is an internet. Okay, let's do another one, which is transport, which was the idea we started with. Can we have transport? So how do you do transport? Well, the transport we said, uh, suppose I have X and Y in a path between them. Earlier I had S and T, but I write, I'm writing them here as X and Y. So X, Y, a path between them. I have something in B of X here. This is the something in B of X and I want to transport it to B of Y. Can I do that using path induction? Yes, probably, hopefully, and probably I need to apply something here as well. I probably made the same mistake, but the point is that this has the form of path induction. It's arbitrary endpoints, arbitrary path, do something. So path induction says, okay. So then it's from P of Z of A, Yes, Nikolai is pointing out that there is a third way to do concatenation where you do path induction on both arguments and then you say what the result is. Um, so path induction here would say, okay, fix both points to be the same. So just Z and then uh, what does this become? This becomes B of Z, B of Z. So can we inhabit this type? Yes, that's easy. You get a Z, you get a U, you answer U. So you just have to explain how you transport along identity paths. And the answer is, well, you don't have to do anything. So again, this is not the real U, this is the bound U. So then here we need a U like that. And we're going to get transport. So this is what we did is really is a generalization of what we were doing earlier. Okay, here's the third one, which is action on paths. Okay, so if I have a map F from A to B, then, I should be able to map not just points using F, but also paths. That would be nice. How do you do that? 
again is just path induction all these very basic things will be path induction so i'm here sloppily writing f of p um less sloppy here this less sloppy would be to write something like apply f to p or invent some other notation for this um but a mathematician would just say fp here and not worry about notation when we do proof assistance we will need to be a little more careful so how do we do the action of a map on a path well again this is what we want to do for any for any endpoints on the path we just want to produce a path in here so the path induction applies so you just have to explain how you're going to do it in the case of the identity path but the identity path is super easy to to, to act on because it's it just it should just give us the identity path so here did i manage to write here uh, xyp i think to, now i don't need see now i don't need to apply anything i'm landing directly in the path space so you just do the path induction you say add the identity is this and you get the answer and the equation is that f acts on oh now it's suddenly raffle i don't know why it's raffle i had a it's probably late in the night so this is supposed to be id path x and this is supposed to be id path f of x like that so uh we get also action on paths uh and then you can do lots of little lemmas which are there in the proof assistant saying that also f action on paths commutes with path concatenation and, and inverses yeah and there's an exercise about inverses so we actually now we have a little bit of time for exercises so now we will discuss the exercises first and i hope everybody realized that you need to have a copy of the exercises when you go to the breakout room so these are in the pdf file that is on discord under resources and also i think somebody was producing a url showing where to find it there it is tom is now putting it in the chat the notes okay could you enable screen sharing in the breakouts rooms yes we could i think Mathieu can try to do that but let's look at the exercises okay so the first one is to prove the other identity here and Guess what? It's going to be induction, path induction. And then there is another one, is to construct the inverse path, which is the inverse path, which is if you have a path from X to Y, then you can get a path from Y to X. And I would hope that once you have done one and two, that you will feel that path induction is a bit boring. Well, it's a bit boring because we're applying it in the boring cases. And then the third one is to say the following, so that if I give you a path, from if I have u and v, which are in the total space, and you have a path between them, uh, between the first projections, and then you have a path between the second projections, where you need to be careful how you say that, because the first projection, uh, what am I saying? <clears throat> um, this should be a two. This should be a two. This deserves a red color. Uh, no, uh, this is V2, this, I, I apologize, this is messed up, let's fix this. So this should say pi 2 of V, and this should say pi 2 of U. Here's the correct one, right? Does this look better? If I have a, a, if I have a path between the, first, uh, between the first projections, and I have a path between the second projections, then they're equal where in order for this to type check, to in order for this to make sense, I have to first transport the second projection of U to the correct, to the correct um, um, fiber. Also P pi one U equals P pi one V. This one is a one. I don't know what I was on when I produced this exercise. Okay, Whew. exercise.